talk about Calvinism, we're going to talk about Arminianism a little bit here this morning and hopefully give some clarity on those two issues and those two subjects. But my point is this, and that is that they were claiming faith in Jesus Christ, but yet they were backing off and backing away from Jesus Christ when they were getting pressure from the other Hebrews, the other Jews, that were saying, you know, this Jesus thing is okay, but don't forget all the other things, all the other hoops that you need to, th- to jump through in order to be a good Jew. And also, uh, if you want to have this Jesus thing, you can do that too. So they were feeling the pressure to some degree, and they were kind of backing off. And they were sticking to these elementary principles that really could have been uh, just about any faith, any doctrine, any, not any people, but a lot of people at that particular time. So I want you to know and understand that he is talking to those who are immature. Now, he also begins to move into something that's quite a bit deeper, but talking about immaturity. Now, being a parent, raising kids, you watch them go through a very immature stage, right? I mean, they're little, they can't do anything. They're cute as a button, but they're still helpless. And you've got to pretty much take care of them. But you do what you've got to do. You get up in the middle of the night, you feed them, and uh, it's, they start out on milk. But that's cute, that's okay. Throwing up on you, you let them get by with that for a period of time. But if they were 18 or 19 or 20 doing that, it'd be a little weird, right? So you expect a certain progress or progressive maturity in that individual. It reminded me of this story. There was a man that had five siblings. He had three sisters and two brothers. And one night he was chatting with his mom about how he had changed, as, as, how she had changed as a mom from the first child to the last. Now, you guys remember those changes, those of you that have kids that are spread out a little bit, whether you have two or you have three. And you realize that in the, in the first one, you probably have how many albums, how many pictures of that first one, right? You, you just, you've, got a, you've got a ton of those. How about the last one? Not so much. You know, the, the last one has to go through all the pictures going, where am I at? Where, how come you didn't take any pictures of me? It just seems to be that, that natural progression if you will. So here he is. He's got some, some uh, siblings and he's probably a, a parent himself trying to figure it out. And he's asking his mom, mom, how have you changed from the first child to the last? And she told him that she had mellowed out a lot over the years. She goes, when your oldest sister coughed and sneezed, we call the ambulance. She goes, now when your younger brother swallows a dime when he was young and he swallowed a dime, we just told him it was coming out of his allowance. changes that take place. There's one thing that we need to not change, and that is our vision of Jesus Christ, who we know him to be. Now, folks, I think that what ends up happening a lot of times with Christian, let me, let me, let me back up. What happens with churched people, we're a combination of a lot of things. We, we grow up Our journey is not always in a Bible-believing church. Sometimes we start out going with a friend. Sometimes we go to another church. Sometimes we go to another one. Sometimes we switch two or three or four or five, six times before we finally find home. Now, my point is this. If we're not careful, we can pick up things along the way. We can pick up things that may or may not be true, or we can pick up things that may or may not be really relevant to our faith. Stuff that we might have picked up at one church was a hoop they wanted you to jump through. But when you really study the word of God, you realize it's a hoop you don't need to jump through. So we're going to kind of deal with some of these again a little bit this morning. I want to go back through, if we can, just as a recap of last week. He encouraged the Hebrew converts to move on from those elementary principles of Christ and into a deeper knowledge of Jesus. Those elementary principles were, in case you're taking notes, repentance from dead works. That means getting up, turning around, going the other direction. Dead works are anything we do apart from Jesus Christ. 
They're just, they're just dead. They, they, they don't mean much. Now, does that mean you don't have a lot of other things that you do in life? Of course you do a lot of other things. But for the Christian, hopefully everything is motivated out of that relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what gives it life. Without that, there's not much life in it. The second one was faith towards God. The third one was doctrine of baptisms. The f- uh, fourth one was laying out of hands. And the fifth was a resurrection of the dead. Now, I'm not going to go through any of those this morning because those are all in a teaching from last week. But having moved on from those principles, and he compared those to baby's milk. He compared that to being uh, a child, a young child. We're given some stuff here, if you will, that's, that's got some meat to it. I want to read something to you by Charles Spurgeon. By the way, Charles Spurgeon was... He classified himself as a Calvinist, but I don't think he was a five-point Calvinist, and that'll make more sense as we go on. Charles Spurgeon said this. He says, when a Calvinist says that all things happen according to the predestination of God, he speaks the truth, and I am willing to be called a Calvinist. But when an Arminian says that when a man sins, the sin is his own, and that if he continues in sin and perishes, His eternal damnation will lie entirely at his own door. I believe that he speaks the truth, though I am not willing to be called an Arminian. The fact is, there is some truth in both of these systems of theology. That's the truth I want to get across this morning. We seem to think we have to put a label on who we are. We're great at labels. Remember back in high school? Who were your four or five groups? The nerds, the jocks, the football players, right? You had, you had your, your group. We love to put labels on people. We, we, we do that still. We put labels on people. We go through the word of God. Instead of reading the word of God and accepting it for what it says, we feel that we've got to fall into some classification. We've got to pick up some doctrine so that we can identify with these people or identify with these people. I hope that I can get across this morning that the only one we need to identify with is Jesus Christ. The only truth that we need to agree with is the truth that is in the word of God. Not necessarily a this or a that. Putting a label on ourselves and say, I am a this, I am a this. I I think the most important label is, I love Jesus Christ. The rest of it falls into place with that. So pray with me and we will begin. Father, we do love you. I pray that you give us your heart, you give us your word. I pray, Father, that whatever construct that we might have, that we've put together, maybe pulled a little bit from here, a little bit from there, and we say, I am a this or I am a that, I pray that we'd sift those through the word, that we would think based on the Word of God and what the Word of God says. So many times we think that the Word contradicts itself, but it does not. So many times we think that, well, if one of them is true, the other one cannot be true. But usually it's a lack of our understanding, Father. So I pray that you'd help us. Help us to love you more. Help us to fall in love with you so deeply that we don't worry about any of this stuff. Because, Father, we know that if we abide in you, everything's going to be okay. We love you, Lord, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. And we said, amen. Please look at Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4, 5, and 6. He says, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the good word of God, and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away, to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God, and put him to an open shame. Now, what makes this passage difficult is that it seems to contradict, as I said, what some of you may have been taught. And like I said, growing up, we attend different churches. Some of those churches are Calvinists. 
Some of those churches are Arminian in their belief. And some of the teachers that we read today, some of the famous preachers and teachers that we read today fall on both lines. There's some that fall on one line, there's some that fall on the other one. But I would like for us to not worry too much about what these two men believed. And again, back to the Word of God. All right, I'm going to give you the first or the five points of Calvinism. Those that are taking notes. They spell TULIP. T-U-L-I-P. And here's what they stand for. The first one, total depravity. I'm going to go through the five and then I'll come back and I'll deal with them a little bit more in, in depth. First one is total depravity. The next one is unconditional election. The third one is limited atonement. The fourth one is irresistible grace. And the fifth one is perseverance of the saints. So I'm going to do my best to try to represent these two. Let's go back to total depravity. The Calvinist belief is that man is dead in his trespasses and sins, totally unable to save himself. But many Calvinists carry this a step further. And they claim that man cannot even desire a relationship with God apart from his working in their hearts. In fact, it's a claim that God must regenerate a person before they can even desire to come to know Jesus Christ. That's it in its fullest impact. Now, please let me say this. I know a lot of I have, you know, friends and, and people, uh, pastors that I know, that are Calvinist in their belief, but they're not all five points. They don't, they don't believe in all five points. They may believe in one or two points, maybe three points, but they don't believe in all five. There's some good scriptures to back up what they believe. If you take a look at Genesis 2.17, Genesis 2.17, he says, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Now, what is the, the, what is, how can you, can you have various degrees of death? I was mostly dead all day. You're dead, right? If you're dead, you're dead. Now, we know that God was talking about being spiritually dead, separated from God because of this sin. Romans 3.23, it says, For all have what? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Okay, so we are all sinners. That's what the scripture says. In John 6, 44, it says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him to me and I will raise him up in those last days. There are other scriptures that support this. So you can understand why they would come to this total depravity. And if you've lived more than a few years on the planet, there's a lot of depraved things going on in this planet. Number two, unconditional election. Unconditional election. Okay, this, it means this. In eternity past, God chose or elected certain people to obtain salvation. Some Calvinists, although not all of them, they carry this belief even further and teach that is what is referred to as double election or reprobation. That's the teaching that God in eternity past selected some people to go to heaven and others to go to hell. And there's nothing anyone can do to change God's election. For example, if you are elected for heaven, you'll go to heaven regardless of what you do. And if you're elected for hell, there is no possibility of you ever being saved. John Calvin himself taught this, but he also said, and I quote, it is a terrible doctrine. Now, here's Romans 8, 29. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. So you can see where they would pull this scripture and they would see and uh, pull, pull this belief from. 
But it is a terrible doctrine. It is a terrible doctrine to think that God, for some reason, picked a few of you guys to get saved and the rest of you don't have a chance. Right? I know I'm saved. I don't know about you, but I know I'm saved. I'm one of the elect. No, I'm just messing with you, okay? The only reason I'm saved is because of Jesus Christ. And, you know, the Calvinists would say, well, that's because you were chosen. Before the foundation of the world, you were chosen. But guys, I believe that this blows John 3.16 out of the water. For God so loved the that he gave his only begotten son, that world and whoever. Those are pretty definitive. Okay, so if that was not the case, why would there be a need for Jesus? If God just picked certain people to be saved and they were going to be saved no matter what they did, there would be no need. God could have done that without the cross. He could have done that without Jesus Christ. He could have just programmed us all ahead of time and our fate would have been sealed. Okay. Limited atonement. Limited atonement. Excuse me. Well, now, if you're going to have unconditional election, and only a few have been elected, then you have to know and understand that the belief in Jesus Christ is limited. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, that means that only those who have been pre-selected can receive Jesus. So, his atonement for sins only applies to those who are saved. Some truth to that. But what messes it up is that they were saved without a choice. They were just, they were just chosen. And everybody else is going to go to hell no matter what they do. So here's the limited atonement. Jesus did not die for the sins of the entire world. But that he instead only died for those that are elected to go to heaven. The argument is that Christ's work on the cross is for all for whom he died, and that is just the elect. That he could not have shed his blood for those who were lost. Some Calvinists have gone to great lengths to explain away limited atonement, saying, for example, that Jesus died for all, but does not pray for all. And that his death theoretically could save everyone, but is effectively only for the elect. The end result is the same. It's the same in either case. The belief that Jesus only died for some people. That's not the God of the Bible. That's not the Jesus Christ of the Bible. If that were true, you could probably look next to you at your husband or wife and say, Man, I don't know if you're saved. Irresistible grace. Here's the next one. Number four. Irresistible grace. This is the belief that God will draw to himself those who he elected. He'll draw them in. There will be a period of time in which he draws them in regardless of their rebellion against him. Excuse me. No matter how far they are away from him. No matter whether they want him or not. God's going to, at some point in time, he's just going to draw them in with this irresistible grace and that man cannot resist that drawing of God to himself, no matter what. Number five, perseverance of the saints. This basically is eternal security. You guys heard that phrase, and I'm sure you've heard it a lot. Eternal security is the doctrine that often attracts people to Calvinism because it's the belief that a true born-again Christian cannot lose or give up his salvation because salvation is entirely a work of God, not man's. Sounds good, doesn't it? But let's look at Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. These are going to be a couple that they use to validate this point of view. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, he says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. We can agree with that, right? Completely agree with that. John 10, verse 27 through 29. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life 
and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. Some good scriptures, some fantastic scriptures to back this up. Now, I'm going to give you just a very, very small list of men who publicly say that they are Calvinists. In the past, Charles Spurgeon. Everybody quotes Spurgeon, don't they? I mean, every, every church you go to, every pastor I know quotes Charles Spurgeon. A.W. Pink, in case you haven't heard of him, some of his works on prayer are the absolute best. I encourage you to look up his works and read his works on prayer. Jonathan Edwards, R.C. Sproul, John Piper, John MacArthur, Alistair Begg, and quite a few more. Are these bad men? No. Are they heretics? No. You will find, if you go down the list, you'll find that they believe in various points of Calvinism, but many of them, not all five points of Calvinism. Here's the point I'm trying to make to you guys. There's truth in both. Just like Spurgeon said at the beginning, there's truth in both of these. You do not have, you do not as a Christian have to pick one or the other. All you've got to do is pick the Word of God. That's what we've got to do. We've got to take a look at the Word of God and see what the Word of God says. But you don't have to pick a side here. Okay, now we're going to compare that to being an Arminianist or Arminianism. Okay, number one, it's election based on knowledge. Number two, unlimited atonement. Three, natural inability. Four, prevenient grace. And five, conditional perseverance. So, let's go back to top one. Election based on knowledge. This is the belief that God chose those who would be saved in eternity, past, based on his foreknowledge of those who would respond to and receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, let me read that again, because it's easy to miss this. You might be thinking, what's the difference? Listen closely. The belief that God chose those who would be saved in eternity past based on his foreknowledge of those who would respond to and receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. It rejects the concept that God's elected anyone for hell. Now, let's take a look at this. Many, many times we try to interpret God in very limited ways. What do I mean by that? If God has no beginning and God has no end, He always has been and always will be. He's not on a linear timeline like we are. I don't mean to be spacey or Star trek here, but bear with me here. We live in a linear timeline. We're born and we die. We have events that occur on that timeline. That's not true with Jesus. He always has been. He always will be. He's on this side of time. He's on that side of time. He's on that side of time and this side of time and that side of time. And he's God. He's everything. He's all things. There is nothing that God doesn't know. And he knows it before we know it. (laughs) So it's very, very easy for God to know who will receive him and who won't. For you and I, we don't have that capability. We don't have that possibility. It doesn't exist with us, but it exists with God. So what is being said here is that based on that foreknowledge of God, knowing who will receive him and knowing who will not, then he's able to prepare eternity for those who will receive him. That is so much different than saying, you can't get saved, you're going to hell. It is so much different. It is a completely different thing. 
Okay? Romans 8, 29, and 30. Let's go back to that. For whom he foreknew, okay, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. He knows that they're going to come to know Jesus Christ. He knew that ahead of time. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, he also called. Whom he called, he also justified. Whom he justified, those he also glorified. In other words, if you give your life to Jesus Christ, you didn't surprise God. It's not like, I'm not going to receive him, I'm not going to receive him. Oh, I'm going to receive him. I surprised him. I got ahead of him on that one. He knows. He knows whether you're going to receive him or not. That's what he went to the cross for. For all of mankind. Not for a few, but for all of mankind. Will all of mankind receive him as their Lord and Savior? Will they abide in him? No. Just because someone's given a gift doesn't mean they open it. It doesn't mean they want to open it. But it is there. Unlimited atonement. Now you might remember the Calvinist said limited atonement. Here we got unlimited atonement. It's the belief that Jesus died on the cross for all people. That his blood is sufficient to pay the penalty for the sins of every man, woman, and child who has ever lived. Thus, all mankind is savable. Can, I mean, I think we can agree with that. That all mankind is savable. If that's not true, I'm in trouble. Perhaps you're in trouble. Perhaps Uncle Buck's in trouble. Perhaps somebody in your family is in trouble. You look at them and you go, you know what? That's the last person in the world to get saved. And I've lived long enough to watch that. That's usually the first person to get saved. Because they're running away from God so hard and so strong that God ends up working in their life in an amazing way. Unlimited atonement. I mentioned John 3.16, but let me read John 3.16 through 18 to you. For God so loved the world... That he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe in him is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. In other words, if we don't believe in Jesus Christ, there is no door number two. There is no door number three, door number four. You don't get to pick and choose your point of salvation or eternity. You don't get to pick that. Well, you do, but there's only one door, and that's Jesus Christ. But notice that he loved the world, and he gave his only begotten son, that whoever. So it's open to everyone, but not everyone will receive it. I heard the gospel before I finally gave my heart to Jesus Christ, and I didn't want it. There was part of me that said, you know, if I receive Jesus, I got to quit playing music in bars. I got to quit doing this. I got to quit doing that. I got to quit doing that. I don't, I don't, I'm not ready for that. I don't want to do that. That was my choice to reject God's love. It's also my choice to receive his already paid price and provision for my sin. Okay, natural inability. It's the teaching that man cannot save himself, but that the Holy Spirit must effect a new birth in him. Strict Arminians do not believe that man is totally depraved and condemned as a result of Adam's sin. Well, now, that one you're going to have to put some thought into, aren't you? You have to put some thought into that. But I want you to not watch it through Calvinism and Arminianism, even though that's what I'm doing here. I want you to watch it through the Word of God. I want you to just take a look at what the Word of God says in these two. Last one. Prevenient grace. It's the Arminian belief that the preparatory work of the Holy Spirit enables the believer to respond to the gospel and to cooperate with God in the working out of that person's salvation well you have John six forty four that says no one can come to me unless what the father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up in that last day so that drawing of the Holy Spirit maybe some of you are feeling it this morning I pray so 
that no matter how you've been living or what you've been doing, maybe God is tapping you on the shoulder and saying, I love you. And you know what he's saying is true. And you need to give your life to me. It's kind of funny, you know. We get so strange when it comes to this. We think that if we give our life to God, we're going to miss something. That we're going to get cheated out on something. And you can ask almost any Christian that loves Jesus and you will find that their life has been richer, their life has been better on every level than it's ever been in their entire life. He may t- tell us and work on, on us and say, us, say to us, that, you know, that thing's not good for you. But I found that in my life, if he does that, he's usually got something 10 times better waiting for me and I'm just not willing to give up. I'm just not willing to let God do things his way because I think I've got a better way to do it. Conditional perseverance. Now, it's the belief that men can choose to reject God and therefore lose his salvation even after he has been born again rather than the once saved, always saved doctrine of the Calvinists, the Arminianist believes that you must abide in Christ to be saved and that you can choose to walk away from God. Arminius himself and his early followers stated that they were unsure of this doctrine and that it required further biblical study. Later, however, they just folded it in to their doctrine and they accepted it. But look at Matthew 24, 13. Matthew 24, 13. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. I hope I've confused you. (laughs) Because I want you to think. I want you to read the word of God. I want you to take what the word of God says And try your best to not necessarily wash it through these two stereotypes. But here's the thing. I think the wrong question is, do you believe in eternal salvation? I think that's the wrong question. In fact, I think that's not even the question at all. I think the statement needs to be that as long as I'm abiding in Jesus Christ... I don't ever have to ask that question. I don't need to even ask that question. I don't have to worry about whether or not I'm saved. I know that I'm saved. I know that I'm saved because of Jesus Christ. And I know that if I love him and I abide in him, that's not a question I need to ever worry about. It's not a question I need to be concerned with. And I have found that in some cases, and and, and please understand I'm saying in some cases, sometimes when we're worried about it, it's because we're really not abiding in Christ. We're doing things we shouldn't do. We're skirting on edges. We're doing things that we know are not good. And then we have to wonder, am I really saved? If If I'm really saved... Why am I doing these things? Well, because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But I don't have to put myself in in either one of these categories to know that the word of God says I'm a sinner. And that the way of salvation is through the cross and through Jesus Christ. Now, uh, we're going to dissect this a little bit. Look at back to chapter 6, verses 4 through 6. For it is impossible. I want you to underline a few words. For it is impossible, underline the word impossible, for those who were once enlightened, underline enlightened, enlightened, and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit, underline partakers of the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the good work of God, the good word of God, underline tasted the good word of God, and the powers of the age to come, I underline that one, If they fall away, 
to renew them again to repentance since they crucify again to themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. Now, I think that we can, we can agree that impossible means impossible. There's no trick uh, Hebrew word here. There's no, no trick word, no Greek word. It just it means impossible. But what I'd like to do is I'd like to take some of the clarifiers away from those verses. Okay? Take some of the clarifiers away. If you take the clarifiers away, it, com- it comes down to this. It is impossible if they fall away to renew them again to repentance. That's what it says. This is plain as day. Now, I can rationalize this. I can try to make it fit with my doctrine. Or I can just say, this is what the Word of God says. The phrase fall away. It means to slip aside. It means to deviate from the right path. It means to turn aside, to wander, to error, to fall away from the true faith, and that is the worship of God. So the end result seems pretty clear. But let's take a look at the clarifiers. Those who were once enlightened... This word enlightened is what happens when you take a photograph. Or at least when we use paper for photographs. And it basically means, uh, the, the Greek word is photizo. And, and it's, it's putting light, shining light into a dark place. And I took a photography class over at Glendale College many years ago and uh, that's when we actually used cameras and paper and we actually did our own developing and all of that stuff. But one of the first things they had you do, right, was put your hand on photosensitive paper and then shine light on it. And then you had to develop it and you ended up, of course, with, a, with basically, uh, uh, because of the light-sensitive paper, when you put the light on it, the place where your hand was turned dark and everything else remained light. That's the point. Those who have been enlightened. These people that we're talking about here, at least to some degree, understood who and what Jesus was all about. And it says that they have tasted of the heavenly gift. There's no trick words here either. They just mean what they say. They have tasted of the heavenly gift. Now what's that? The greatest gift any of us could have is Jesus Christ. I believe when we accept Jesus Christ, he also fills us with other, he gives us other gifts to work with. But that heavenly gift, gift, I believe here, is referring to Jesus Christ. And it says here, look at the next one, have become partakers, partakers of the Holy Spirit. That word partakers means to partner with. To partner with. You can sit down at a meal and not eat, but you're not partaking of the meal. When you partake of the meal, you're ingesting the same food that everybody else is ingesting. It becomes a part of you. So, they have become partakers of the Holy Spirit. They have allowed the Holy Spirit to live in their life. And they've tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. So these folks have digested the word of God and they've understood it. They have also been partakers of the dunamis or the power of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God. Now, I don't know about you guys, but that sounds like a Christian to me. It sounds like a Christian to me. And it says, if it is impossible if they fall away to renew them again to repentance. Why? Why? It says, because they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. Now, I know the question is, were these people saved? I'm going to let you answer that one. I'm going to let you study, and I'm going to let you go over these again. And I'm going to ask you to uh, not put the labels, but just read the Word of God and see what you think. Are they people that today we would call born again? 
Is it possible to get that close to God and not come to having a saving faith in Him? Is it possible to truly have a born again experience? To truly be born again? To, to say, God, you're God and I'm not. And I want you as my Lord and my Savior. And, and I mean it. I'm not just doing this because mom and dad did it, because I'm in church, or even because of the pastor today. I'm doing this because I know it's right and I know it's true. And I want you in my life and I want you in my heart. Is it possible to get to that place and not have a saving faith in him? According to Matthew chapter 7, Verses 21 through 23, that answer would have to be yes. Matthew seven twenty one through 23. Here's what it says. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father, my heavenly Father in heaven, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out demons in your name? Have we not done wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who who practice lawlessness. That word practice is extremely important. Why do you practice? Practice to get good at something. Practice is something that you are committed to. Practice is something that you do regularly. Even if it costs you a lot, you practice. If you take piano lessons, you practice. If you take guitar lessons, you practice. Then what does it mean if we practice sin? It means that we do it a lot. It means that we do it intentional. It means that we know the difference between right and wrong and we just decide to do it anyway. You see, I think there's a difference in sin. Now, I know that God hates all sin. But I'm not talking about God's perspective. I'm talking about us. I believe that there's a difference And I believe that that big difference is before we knew Jesus Christ, we didn't have the power to not sin. We were all sinners fallen short, fallen short of the glory of God. No power against it. When you and I come to know Jesus Christ, we now have the Holy Spirit living in our life. And we have the power to not do it. We do it because we want to. In the face of Jesus Christ. Now let me ask you this. If there is no door number two and we don't love the Lord enough to not practice sin. Now please understand, we're sinners. We're going to sin. That's our nature. But the cross covers that. But if we don't love Jesus enough to not practice it, Guys, and I believe there's a clear distinction with this. I believe the distinction is I know what I'm doing and I want to do it and I'm going to do it. I don't care what God thinks or anybody else. I'll just ask for God's forgiveness when it's over with and I'm I'm right back where I, I was. I think that makes a fool out of God. Well, actually, it makes a fool out of us to assume that God is that stupid. To not know and understand when he's being played We're all, we, we can all go down this path, can't we? We can all fool ourselves into thinking that we really love Jesus when the reality of it is the one that we love is ourselves. We love it. We love the sin. We love what we're doing. We don't want to give it up. So basically, Lord, I hope you hang on to me long enough that I've come to my senses. But I'm going to keep doing it. 
Let me give you this reassurance, and I think I've already referenced it, and that is just fall in love with Jesus. Don't worry about these two. Just fall in love with Jesus. Just love him. Just love him. Just stay close to him. And this will never be a concern for a child of God. We're sinners. We're already saved by the grace and the mercy of God. But let us not get into a place to where some habit begins to take us over and we lose the ability to be able to choose and to choose in the favor of God to where we're just caught up in the sin and we don't care who knows. I mean, we care who knows. We don't, we don't care if uh, we just keep doing it. We don't care if it breaks the heart of God. I'm going to close with this. John Corson said this. You cannot lose your salvation, but you can leave it because God won't force eternal life on anyone. Why don't you think about that? What can separate us from the love of God? Neither height, nor depth, nor principalities, nor power, nor things present, nor things to come. No outside force can separate you from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Romans eight, thirty-eight and 39. Only you can. Only, only I, I can separate me from God. My sins separate me from God. And this is what Corson says at the end of that. He says, and that's the warning of this passage. It's, it's, not, it's not eternal salvation or not eternal salvation. The warning of this passage is to some immature people that are arguing over basic doctrines. And he's trying to say, guys, just fall in love with Jesus. Just fall in love with the Lord.